This is the uh, Fellowship of the Link call on Wednesday, October 25th, 2023. I was just going to report in that I had a first call with a, a Dutch fellow named Severin de Witt this morning, who is an IP lawyer by trade, but really cares about trust and started a podcast series called uh, Trust Talk. And is now like the episode 79, just posted this morning his latest one and in interviewing Stephen Covey. And he's been interviewing experts on trust and going sort of going around doing it, but has larger aspirations. He contacted me through LinkedIn. <clears throat> he has larger aspirations to create some kind of a database-y thing, something, some artifact that contains like the wisdom that people hold and knowledge about trust and whatever else. And we went into a really lovely conversation about how and what and where um, that had me smiling a lot because we, we sort of share a bunch of, uh, a bunch of thoughts and ideas about this. Um, and we'll talk again okay. next week. Um, let me pause there and go sure. find Aram on Jitsi. Oh, okay. good point. Thank you. I bet that's what's happening. Thank you. He's on his way over. Thank you. He's. I see his. I see his handsome picture right here already. It's a very handsome picture. Yeah, it's a good one. <clears throat> it doesn't even look synthetic. Yeah, yeah, and the nice bokeh, the nice, the nice blurred background. Gotta say. Hey, Aram. Oh, yeah. He, hey. Oh. Nice photo. Thank you. This one was taken by Post PR. So. <laughs> it, look, it looks somebody, like a post, post official staff photo. Yeah, somebody better at photography than I took it. Um, if it was just me, it would be, I'm sure, much worse. Let's see. There we go. And there you are. Excellent. Yeah. I was just reporting in on a conversation I had this morning for the first time with a Dutch fellow who's an IP lawyer, but uh, it has been become an expert on trust and is right, doing a podcast about trust and is interested in building some kind of online artifact that contains the knowledge about trust that the community holds. And I'm like, let's talk again. So we're talking again. Yeah. Tr trust in what though, exactly? Uh, well, trust is this many faceted thing. So trust in lots of stuff, trust in each other, trust in institutions, uh, even trust in currencies, whatever. I mean, we didn't talk about Bitcoin or anything like that, but you know, the trustless, the trustless platform of, of blockchain and Bitcoin actually requires you to trust the algorithms and however somebody managed to put data on the blockchain, which is not always verifiable or knowable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Well, interesting. Not not a big fan of the blockchain stuff in general, but um uh... I mean, this is always a reoccurring theme about uh, what we can do to, like, demonstrate, make visible trustworthiness in different ways. I don't know if you saw it, but the, uh, a bunch of companies and the BBC are championing, championing a uh, metadata standard around uh, trustworthiness. It's been going for a couple of years now, and sort of had my doubts, but it's starting to get enough pickup that I'm wondering if it might actually be a thing now um, or on the verge of being a thing. Let me pull up the name. Yeah, please. Here it is. C2PA. Um, they have a pretty decent explainer. Coalition that's... for Content Provenance and Authenticity. Yeah. Here's the uh, explainer. Project Origin was its code name, I guess, originally. Yeah. Uh, and the explainer's nice, but honestly, I think the best thing is... I think right on the homepage, they have that really good graphic, maybe. 
Is it still here? Uh, let's see. Frequently asked questions. Guiding principles. Oh, Lord. Introduction video. Do you think it's in there? Maybe. Uh, I think it might be in... Maybe it's in the spec. Hmm. Spec, spec. Uh, I don't see anything that looks like a visual. Yeah, it's figure three in the specification over here. Uh, uh, which makes it very clear that like what it is, is it's like you're adding layers of metadata in a, into a media object. And there are a bunch of different like ways you could do that depending on the media object obviously um but the idea being that like each adjustment adds an additional like object so if you crop it then that crop itself is another additional object on top of the set of metadata objects hmm. basically it's, it's trust by way of provenance right Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to figure out trust exactly, you say, hey, here's a method to determine where this came from and who authored it. And you can trace it through various permutations um, of modification and be confident that each one describes that modification correctly and trust in that. And if it's not there, then, you know, it's not as trustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, it's for media specifically, of course, right? Like it's images audio files things that you can attach metadata to um as like sort of transmittable objects but i think it's gotten to the point where it's pretty interesting sounds like a thing that mark antoine would like i would be involved in yeah um So why Zoom this time instead of Jitsi? Uh, we had uh, too much trouble with uh, Jitsi last time and the time before, different people having different trouble. So I don't know exactly what uh, what the thing was, but uh, uh, I offered up my Zoom and we sort of buckled and went, well, okay, let's try it for a call. Right, well, we, could okay. move, we could move back, but we were trying to use Meet, but we can't record Meet and we like to record the calls. I mean, I prefer Zoom over Meet philosophically. And it, I assume the reason most of us prefer Jitsi is philosophically as well. Um, That's why we were over there. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, anything new and uh, fellowshipy in your life, Aaron? Or in your activities? Uh, I did spend some time this week in trying out some new technology. Uh, called HTMX, uh, and it is very interesting to me. Let me pull up, I have a blog post on it that I can share. Please. Let's see. This is from my sort of loose, loosely written dev blog where I just sort of type as I accomplish things. Mm -hmm. um, but it also links to a glitch site which goes which shows how it works that i've built up as part of testing the technology um the idea is it's sort of a, a way to like that i want to pull up the notes mm -hmm. uh i mean our notes here we go but yeah, the idea being like it solves this particular problem that like single page applications have these very good qualities, but the way people build them is very poor. Um, mostly people like me who think React is sort of a crock of shit. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, oh, the An Anagora doc server is not working. Oh. Um, I was going to put notes in there, but I guess uh, I'll just... Well, and we got Pete, the AI note taker. And Pete, are you watching Jitsi in some sense? or I, I am, yeah. Thank you. 
So nobody else has shown up there. Cool. Thank you for doing that. Um, but basically, like the idea is here. I'll share my screen real quick. Thanks. Do, 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 do. What's HTMX for particularly? Is it for people building single page websites or for devs or for whom? Yeah, I mean, it's for solving the particular problem of uh, that single page websites are best for, which is that it is good to have a version of a website where you can navigate around um, while still being able to uh, play media, right? Basically, the idea being that, like, there's assets that you may wish to retain for whatever reason. Um, and as you navigate, right? So let's pull it up. Right. So, like, this is a website. And when you click on things, it looks like it's navigating. Um, hold on. Let me make this a little larger. Is this somehow website. comparable to TiddlyWiki of old? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, right. So this is a completely artificial URL. If you were to navigate to this, yeah, it would not actually exist, right? You can't route to it. Um, uh, this is just an example of capabilities, but it goes into your history. And if I hit the back button, you'd get back to this. And if I hit the forward button, you go forward to this. Um, and so you can go ahead and hit play on a YouTube video here, right? And do the thing that you normally can't do, which is um, go to a different page. And the YouTube keeps playing, right? I can go to the home page. I could go to this multimedia page, which does have a real URL, but is still artificially constructed in my history. And the video keeps playing uninterrupted. Um, and this is done through like basically HTML properties and hints um, to do some really sort of cool stuff here. I think, let me depart from this for a second. And um, no, I'm not sure that this works in this browser actually. Uh, hold on. Or I may need to log in. Mm -hmm. do, 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 side in. Okay. There you go. Cool. Um, so what you can do is edit project. Okay, there we go. Is essentially you define areas of the page that you want to change, right? So. This is that media button, right? And basically you're saying, hey, go make a URL request like normal to this URL. Mm -hmm. um, and then instead of navigating there, take the content from main content, the div that has this ID and swap it with the main content ID div in this HTML. Um, and then I can define other things like, for example, I'll say, and also if you find a div with an ID of footer in there, swap that out as well. But then I have this div here, which sits outside of main content, don't swap this one. And so I can swap out the various pieces of a page without swapping the whole page to a standard navigation event. Um, and it, lets you do cool things like what I just did, which I don't know how, like, how knowledgeable you are about like navigation and React and single page apps. But basically like this is the core promise of a single page app, which is you keep some assets of a web page in place while changing some other parts of that website. And this is normally accomplished using a lot of complicated, JavaScript code and um, hooks and shadow DOMs and all of this complicated pieces of stuff, right? React itself is a pretty large file. The HTMX file, on the other hand, is like sub one kilobyte. Um, so 
it's much more code efficient and it opens up like interesting things like this, which look like old web stuff, like a web ring here, right? Right. right. But instead of an iframe or anything like that, this top page is pulling IDs and basic HTML off of another site and using it to inform this. So that navigator thing here, I'm having that's a, coming I'm having from a, a previous total site. throwback experience with the web ring interface up, up top. It's like, whoa, whoa, I've just scrolled back in time. Yeah, yeah. But the difference is the bottom is not an iframe. Yeah. And the top can pull information out of this that changes. So, so for example, like this doesn't do it, but I could have it change the title tag or create an artificial URL change that the system would be able to recognize. Right. This one doesn't do it, but. And <laughs> where it says your name here, that could also be changed through instructions from the site below. Right. Is this like transclusion or is this something different? Because you're kind of pulling content in from somewhere else and including it in the local. Um, I guess in some ways it's like like transclusion. Um, but the main difference is like, or at least how they present it, right? The HTMX presentation of their concept is they're interested in speaking the native language of the web just more applicable. So instead of endless JSON documents of different formats and different APIs, et cetera, and trying to layer all of these extra pieces on top of JavaScript that like in the modern age are not really necessary anymore. Most of the things React does with JavaScript that made it unique when it launched are part of core JavaScript now. Um, Instead, you just generate HTML and instruct other HTML to pick it up, right? So instead of having to do a whole bunch of complicated JavaScript to make this work, you just use the HTMX JavaScript, and then you add these directives onto your HTML. HTMX. Hmm. So that motivation section there is is a, a good kind of summary. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit like transclusion in, in which the the page is, you can think of the page as components, but it's not really like transclusion because you're not inserting a page. It's yeah. like you're re re replacing it with, you're swapping things in and out to um, do sub page, uh, sub, sub page addressability uh, while maintaining um, uh, compatibility with the browser conception of, and which exists from actually the early '90s, the browser conception of nav navigation. Yeah, is it, a, is it a stupid way to think about this as like uh, replacing iframe with something far more powerful? I mean, or is that, or is that it's too not, limiting? A con too limiting a conception. Yeah, it's n not really the same thing. I mean, you can use it that way. That's what the web rig site was doing. Right. But it's really more about it's really more about this concept of the single page app and replacing it with something that is more standardized uh with, without having to think about like the complexities of data shape APIs and that type of thing. So like for example, you can have full web pages that it pulls in, but you can also have um Let's see. Maybe a way to say it is is to continue with the same navigation metaphor, but use subpage ad addressability instead of or provide you with subpage addressability rather than mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Entire page. So, like for example, this HTML page is just an HTML fragment, right? It's not a full page, but I can click it and pull it in. And one of the interesting things here is see this tiny caption, this gets pulled in somewhere separate. This is a test page, so it's not working super well, but like mm -hmm. the technology is, it's just the layout's wonky. Um, Sorry. And uh, if I click it again, you can see it removes that because I'm pulling information from a different page. Um, so it's more about that, this idea that like, Single page apps do satisfy a requirement within what we want to accomplish with the web. Um, 
but the in that like they can preserve state over navigation um in the way that apps can right this is the main thing that apps can do that the web has trouble with that single page apps want to accomplish is the idea that the state of the page persists in some area while you navigate to other sections or other areas or other pages in theory and right. this is, and that's the idea here, right? You're retaining some element of page state while providing navigation. And it's funny because for a guy like me who loves permalinks to things, the notion of constructing virtual temporary URLs and of embedding something that has a different URL into this URL and losing that navigability freaks me out a little bit, but I can see the power of it. And I think that's sort of the other thing that's really promising about this, that single page apps do not accomplish very effectively. And this is the, the next thing I want to try with this, but you can build an entire website as standard with all the normal pages and all the normal addresses with the normal assets on it, while still having this layer of um, technology and usability activate when the user starts navigating within that experience, right? So in the example I gave before, you can still go to, right, multimedia.html, um, but then as soon as you start navigating around as a user, all of those layers of technology come back in. And now I can go back to doing the thing that I was doing before. Uh, which is changing this around, right? And that's re the really sort of cool thing to me is the idea that I like, oh, um, yeah, close this. The idea that you can build a website exactly as normal, but then have a, a piece of it that persists once users start navigating around it. Um, I mean, that's really valuable for other reasons too, beyond playing media. Like, let's say I have some like image carousel that I want to keep or like a sidebar with a bunch of social media embeds in it, preserving those so the user doesn't have to rely on their browser to do caching or things to layer back in, in weird ways is a performance uptick too. Um, and like, also, the nice thing is when you have that side of type of single page app approach, you can package it up, manifest it, and make it available offline through the web uh, web app installation process, right? Similar to how you can install the Twitter web app, or I think the Washington Post web app still works. The Washington Post web app, right? Um, and get like some really valuable functionality for users who want to use your site like an app, um, where a lot of the standard pieces get cached locally on their device, and then they're really just navigating through content. But the nice thing is the, the way the content works is more standard, right? Instead of JSON, which can be any of a million different things, and then somebody has to go in and figure out how your JSON API works, you're just generating HTML. Maybe you're generating HTML fragments, maybe whole pages, um, but it's all just HTML and that standardizes things. And what's really interesting is there are events that happen on navigation. So you can use HTML custom elements and their capacity to do unique things when they are mounted into the DOM, when they appear on the page that uh, that really sort of unlock even more functionality. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not, I just did it for one weekend, so I don't know if I can recommend it yet, but it's it impressed me enough and a bunch of other people have recommended it to me that I'm going to give it a try. My partner's moving her uh, her podcast website from... Squarespace to WordPress. Um, it, it, you don't like, is that a reaction to Squarespace or a reaction to doing the move? <laughs> uh, uh, it's a reaction to Squarespace and WordPress. I tried for 15 years to love WordPress. 
I gave up on it entirely. And and I went I went over, believe it or not, to Google Sites, which makes for really simple uh, sites. But uh, but I but but I can stand them up in a second. They look professional, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, yeah I mean. I also have some problems with WordPress. Uh, I personally have stopped using it for anything that I do, except for a very small number of things that it's particularly good at. Right. Um, but, you know, if you're going to give someone a CMS, but also have the full spectrum of options in terms of how to customize it and do whatever you want with it, it's there that really or, isn't that anything or else. Drupal or... Yeah, Drupal, I hate uh, Drupal. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, there you go. I mean, there are some people who sing praises of some other platforms. I think the one that I see the most often as sort of a like get away from WordPress and do something better is a craft CMS. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's I, craft I with a C like or K? With a C. But like craft CMS is like the license is weird i i don't know i don't know a lot about it but i know when examining it one of the things that stood out to me is that the license seems concerning to me mm -hmm. um craft that is that the right one no <laughs> oh fascinating. um interesting yeah, because this is a now, pretty this is a pretty new all in one kind of tool, like twenty twenty one. It's this one here. Thanks. Like the that's what concerns me. Like I don't I don't like the license here, but everyone I know who uses it seems to like it, and it does remind me of like WordPress. What I really loved WordPress. Mm -hmm. um, WordPress suffers from like the classic problem of success, which is. It's become so successful that it's used by enterprises. And so now it must serve enterprises mm -hmm. to some extent, like the, the red hat problem, I think of it as. But uh, yeah, so I'm switching over to WordPress, but I want a way to let people play the podcast and navigate around the page. And HTMX is like a way that I could, with very little work, accomplish that at an existing WordPress site. Because all you need are URLs and HTML, and WordPress generates both. Um, and so I'm going to try it out for that and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll probably go well. It seems like it would be pretty easy to do for my experimentation. I'm trying to add like some additional functionality here in like, terms of like playlists and that sort of thing. But like that's all like bonus like stuff, right? Like. Just being able to have a podcast website where you can navigate around the website without the podcast stopping and without having to download the podcast and put it on whatever you have to play audio files is like a big accomplishment in terms of a thing most podcast websites do not do. Most of the time, they're just sending you on to iTunes or whatever, right? Exactly. And you can see how like potentially the single page app concept can do good things there as well. Because then it, um, if you like a podcast, you could theoretically just take the website as a single page app and install it onto your phone and have it play almost like it's its own app for that particular podcast, right? Mm -hmm. And it has all, it, all of the hooks into features that normal apps have. You can set up notifications. You can get people to subscribe to notifications from a web app for when there are new episodes, you can play in the background, you can control with the media controls, all of the reasons you would go to an app, but now it's just HTML, right? And React, this that's not to say like React web apps don't accomplish this, they do. It's just the cost of maintenance for React web apps is so high, um, right? That's why I haven't done it. Like single page apps, I want, something that is as close to fire and forget as WordPress can get, right? Um, yeah. And this seems like it might be the way to go. I, I don't know, but I'm going to try and find out. Hmm. I also think, I was also thinking a lot, I was hoping Flynn would come in, um, but I guess he's busy. Uh, I was also thinking a lot about 
like how um, the Agora hot loads things into iframes and how this might provide an alternative for that in some interesting ways. Hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. We're learning about HTMX. Uh, and Aram has been playing with it for a week and was giving us a demo, and uh, I'd not heard about it at all. So it's kind of cool. And, and Pete, do you have any uh, perspective you want to add or a different way of looking at it? Because I'm sort of barely wrapping my neurons around it. I, I think I'm just not enough of a coder to understand the... Uh, when you say, hey, it takes a lot less energy and space, it's, it's more economical sort of encode and all that kind of... I get that. That makes a, a lot of sense to me. But the use cases are hard for me to, to figure out. Yeah. It's basically just this concept of the single page app made more web native. Uh, right? The, so, the, so the question after that is why would you have a single page app? Right. So the example of the podcasts, right? The, I mean, the, the answer, the wider answer is because people want apps. Um, I don't understand it, but people do. And having a web native app that does everything an app can do um, without you having to maintain an entire different code base is immensely valuable um, because you know people want apps and you give them the app and then they can go and leave you alone and you only have one code base to maintain. Um, so so it, something in there is a single page. Well, if it's a single page, if if you're on the web, if you're on the web, you have built-in uh, navigation from the browser, um, so you don't have the OS navigation, um, the OS standard navigation. So, so then you have to accommodate that somehow. Somebody's going to hit the back button or the forward button or put a bookmark, and you have to honor that, even though it's kind of outside your remit of this single page app. So that yeah, HTML and... lets you. Right. HTMX lets you do that natively, right? Instead of having right. to load into a single website and then having React try to interpret the route and then load the right components and get you the right experience. Instead, you come to the web page that is the web page. There's so much work that's been done in stuff like React to be like, well, I need to make it so that Google can crawl my web page when I don't have any real web pages, just this one React route route interpreter on one website, right? You don't have to do any of that. You don't have to maintain tons of JavaScript. You don't have to maintain all of these like baking processes to try and pre-build certain things to accommodate all, you know, people who crawl the web in particular ways. It just ends up being a lot easier to do. And then Again, it comes to that idea of preserving state over navigation events, right? And that's important for the use case that I have there, which is like navigate around a website without having to change, without having to pause or stop the video you're watching or the audio you're listening to. Which they're building into the OS now. I mean, the latest version of Mac OS or iOS <clears throat> basically has call out video so you can minimize it, move it around, leave it playing for, you know, and keep going. Yeah, but if the page that hosts that video navigates away from it and the video unloads, that pullout video disappears, hmm. right? But it wouldn't in a single page app model. Okay. Yeah, is the progress? It is a progressive web thing. Why is there uh, not a conservative web movement? <laughs> that's not what the progressive means. There, it just means prog progressive improvement. Yeah. I I get that. All right, I actually just got a, a thing. I got to drop out. Sorry to talk and not. Somebody is flashing the bat signal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, talk to y'all later. Yeah, thanks for thanks Let for that. Let me know a if lot. you have any questions. Yeah, great. All right, bye. Bye. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? You have a bad microphone, so can you can you talk? Try it out. Oh, we don't hear you at all now. Not a sound. It's not bad mic. It's no sound from mic. Maybe he's really, really quiet. Oh, uh, you could just be like like that character in Pitch Perfect, the the woman who sings like this.
Uh, can we read your lips? Wait, wait, let's see if chat GPT knows how to read lips already. That can't be a hard app. Ah, uh, damn it. Sorry. No, not hearing you. And um, it, it was actually working on Jitsi. Although oh, really? Not, so yeah. it's not working on Zoom. That's weird. And picking your microphone from Zoom doesn't give you the right option to get to your earbuds? Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm, un, I'm unaccustomed to having this kind of problem on Zoom, which is why I offered up my Zoom. Is your mic, no, not yet. Is your microphone somehow strangely muted? Your earbuds, no. Huh. We could play charades. Um, bummer. Yeah, you can you can type toward us. Okay. Um, any other things we might want to cover that are fellowship ish? Because uh, we can also fold the call if we don't have any topic to talk about or or whatever else. I don't think I have any big things. I have a bunch of AI stuff, but that's not really fellowship stuff. Well, I'm I'm like the demo of HTMX was really interesting because one of the things I'm puzzling about and I don't have enough depth to understand is why are we kind of stuck in how to how to <clears throat> model, share, and connect information? And where's where might that go? And it feels like a very fellowshipy kind of question because we the conversations here started around, hey, we love open source, we love open content, we love URLs, we love things like that. How do we build knowledge and apps and wisdom out of that? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, the the future is um, uh, AI that understands language and is conversational. So. And so we're just going to offload our burdens to the AIs and inter like chat with them, and that'll be fine. We'll 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 just trust that. Yep. Is this the actual Pete Kaminsky I'm talking to, <laughs> who just said that, or is I, this like some kind of avatar for, uh, stand -in who I've is that for a long, long time. Really? Yeah. Oh man. I I never I never dreamed in my lifetime that we would have. Uh, uh, bots that understand language so well. Yeah. So, so then the the question is, um, how do we deal with uh, enclosure of large language models, right? As opposed to theft, which, which that was such a good answer, Pete. <laughs> that was just brilliant, uh, Chris. I don't know if you saw on the OGM list Pete's answer to Jessica's question about uh, an article that Doug C posted. I think it was him. Uh, uh, that was a misrepresentation of Noam Chomsky. Is that how this started? Is that am I it's on the right? Gil. Oh, it was Gil. That's right, Gil Friend. So anyway, there, there's a there's a fake Chomsky article that is a screed that says that LLMs are the largest theft of of, of property since uh, we stole the lands from Native Americans, you know, with, with colonialism. And Pete comes back with a lovely reply, which are you going to post it someplace public? No. Ah, damn it. Maybe maybe somebody will steal it. <laughs> well, you know what? That'll be me. Um cuz what what I More normally you, please. What, what I normally do with really good screeds on mailing lists which go into the bit bucket is I'll copy and paste them, put them in my brain and I'll make the thought private. So that at least I can find it again later cuz it's cuz it's connected <laughs> to the right things and should that person later decide that it's okay, I'll like release it into the wild. Um uh, etc. Um, I'm perfectly happy with it being in, in the wild, except for to whom it's addressed. I, yeah, you know, I, I will you're mixed up with it. I will anonymize the the name. Uh, so, that... but, but I I have to say I I was sorely tempted to continue on, and and it's like okay, maybe what you're talking about is enclosure, um, and you know, again, I wouldn't wouldn't necessarily compare that with the European uh, Native American conflict, but. But anyway, enclosure is a big deal. So we need we need to figure out how to prove that you're actually not a stand-in computer-generated avatar that is pretending to be Pete. Dude, I have I have thought through that and came up oh. with a solution. Oh, tell us, please. Um, 
Uh, unfortunately, and it doesn't involve applying a knife to your face. Uh, which no. would be easier to simulate, by the way. But but it does require another human on on this side of my camera. Okay. With me. A trustworthy I, human who I, will attest. I think, uh, <laughs> it is a Zoom thing. The, the green screen is actually um, uh, um, assisting or or optimizing the virtual background. I so the the way to do it is to have one or two a couple of people in conversation um, real-time conversation with a lot of uh like emotional cues and things like that um it's going to be a long time before ai fakes that well is my is my thing um for instance i mean i, I wonder the simple test and I, be, I bet you that current versions of avatars that emulate people will fail this telling a joke and seeing how quickly it gets it and telling a nuanced joke where your answer, your response wouldn't just be to laugh, ha 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 ha, but to laugh and to like raise an eyebrow or to laugh and to empathize or to laugh and to like like the moment it gets you, the moment you're crossing up a couple of things, I bet that's really hard to do. But I wish yeah, I'm, I, I hope I'm not wrong. That's that's a fair one. I so even my test with the, it just it just multiplies the complexity kind of. It doesn't really. So it's going to be, it'll last a couple of years, but not past that. I think the, so the humor thing, the, that's a good one. I like it a lot. And, and you'd have to administrate that test or administer that test very carefully because um, I, people do it all the time that they don't get a joke, but they want right. to pretend that, that they, they're going along with it. Right. So uh, it's a really common response to go, or you know, or to like change the change the subject really quickly um, right. and leave the other person off off their foot. So these things, these systems will also probably be really good at lie detection or obfuscation detection. Uh, you know, they'll be they'll be like NLP masters where they can detect skin tone, temperature, whatever, which all are affected by our emotional state, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I. Man, actually, just the the pulse thing, where um, where you can use the minute, where you can see somebody's pulse uh, through you know color. I'm surprised that during the pandemic there weren't more stories of or software for like iPhones and Android phones detecting disease, doing a whole bunch of other health stuff. I I was pretty sure early in the pandemic that that was going to be a big thing. Never materialized. Uh, we got stuck on whether or not it was airborne or not. <laughs> well, yeah, ex except some other vector could have come in and said, hey, guys, you can tell from somebody's voice and breathing that they've got something. Yeah. And you can tell a day before they know they've got something. Yeah. Wouldn't that be useful? I mean, we're, they were doing that with early onset Parkinson's, I think, and other sorts of things. You can you, you can detect essential tremor. Uh, yeah. in software before you can tell you've got it. I mean, there's a bun bunch of stuff like that that's already happening. I, I think it's it's doable. It's just... Um... Chris, yeah, your, your, Chris, your Zoom troubles are melting my brain. This normally doesn't happen. And we keep moving. The, the hilarious thing is that Fellowship of the Link keeps shifting platforms because a different person keeps having trouble with each of our different platforms. That's hilarious. Um, so I like that you're you've developed kind of a Turing test for because this is going to be a problem. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to the first Zoom call we hold where there's like a mystery new person on the call who appears lifelike but isn't. Yeah, that'll be fun. That's gonna be interesting. How far away are we from that? A couple of years. So not this year, not next, but 2025? Yeah, 25, 26. At this pace. <laughs> Crazy. Um, you know, now that I think about it, the, the way that you would mask, like, I don't know, I, you would have somebody have intermittent problems, you know, oh, my microphone doesn't work. Oh, my video doesn't work, you know. So you think Chris is there. a fake? Oh I my God! Say, but... <laughs> and and this is so. This is actually a game of vampire or mafia, 
where Chris was trying to get us to realize that he's not a fake by accusing you of being the vampire. <laughs> okay, this is really interesting. Yeah, Chris is confessing now on the chat for anybody watching the video later who's wondering what the hell we're up to. <laughs> but it's good. I like it. I, I, totally. Like, ah, uh, dog ate my homework. Uh, lost that email. Uh, don't know. Oh, there he is with effects. That's perfect. <laughs> God, the simulation is so good, Chris. There's um, a... Uh, there's a um there's a video short uh, text to video short uh you know text to ai video short competition that's going on right now um all the entries are in and the judging is coming out in a day or two um but it's it's interesting watching how how you construct kind of a narrative movie <laughs> um uh with you know the limited generation capabilities that we have right now so hmm. kind of the same thing you know you, you have these little short things and you kind of fake that you you can make a whole movie, and they're pretty good actually. And I screwed up. I I said vampire should be werewolf. I was totally on the wrong game. Hmm. More evidence for the werewolf. <laughs> the so wait, does that mean that I'm the avatar fake because I didn't get the reference right? I uh, Joanne and I are watching a police procedural where uh, part of the evidence that was wrong probably but part of the evidence was uh, a misspelling in a typed chat session is this bollock borlick or whatever no dead 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 patch what's the name of the procedure it's deadlock. a it's a police de de deadlock that you told me about deadlock was awesome uh this one is line of duty which uh is much more serious and, ah. and intense uh, very very many of the episodes we end with I did not see that coming. <laughs> That's cool. We just watched the movie. Remember movies? Uh, the Burial, which is a drama, dramatization of an actual lawsuit against a company that was trying to roll up funeral homes and got sued by a super glitzy, glitzy lawyer played by Jamie Foxx. Uh, was it good? It was quite good. It was like, I liked it. It was. It's, it's on our list. It was nice. Uh, it, it was good. It was, you know, not the Pelican Brief, but <clears throat> but in there. <clears throat> so, Chris, since you are hobbled, I'm wondering two things. I'm wondering what platform to use next Wednesday. And I'm wondering if we should just fold our pup tents right now because we've had a nice time. And uh, Chris, you can't actually communicate unless you want to try doing semaphore or Morse code in the chat. Or you can do Morse by... Oh, good. Okay. So keep Zoom. Sounds great. I, I've i been doing Zoom now intensely since the beginning of pandemic, and very few people have trouble, the kind of trouble you're having, Chris. So it's like, wow, what? I wish I knew what was going on here. Are you using some kind of exotic operating system? Are you on like a very, very old version of Red Hat Linux or something? Who knows? Um, but at least you can still hear and see us or at least hear us, we, old Windows 7. Now there, see, see, that could be <laughs> that could be a piece of it. it makes a lot of sense. Um, with there being no motion to preserve the call, I uh, move we I'm good to go. roll up the sidewalk and uh, cool, and see you all in a week. And Pete, I'll probably see you much sooner. Sounds good. Cheers. Thanks, guys.